Hey everybody. Um, I uh, before we before we get into the show, um, for those who um, know and for those who who do not, um, we found out a little bit ago that um, our dear friend Meredith Logren passed away last night, um, and uh, we're all very deeply saddened and shocked um, by this. And uh, we just want to say. You know, uh, keep your prayers, uh, keep, you know, keep focused on on just praying for um, for her family and for her loved ones. Um, we as a community uh, really need to surround uh, those who are close, close to her. Um, Meredith was a great lady. Um, she was a friend of the Dastardly Dingoes. She was a friend of Rising Tide. Um, she was she was she was everything rising tide is all about uh that lady shared um all of our projects she um she you know had all of us on her shows um with her and nita and um our heart goes out to you nita um very much right now we love you we're praying for you um and uh i'd just like to before we get started tonight just wanted to um uh just kind of have a moment of silence um for her and then we'll jump into the show because i think that's what she'd want us to do is just to keep going and to talk about creating talk about um character building which is what we're going to be talking about tonight and um we hope that you join us in the comment section so uh, we're gonna have a moment of silence and then we're going to jump into the intro and then we're going to get going with the show Thank you all. Let's get going. Welcome to the Dastardly Dingoes Podcast, a show that celebrates all things nerdy. All th- You'll get an insider's look into the world of comic books, graphic novels, TV and film, gaming and pop culture, as well as the technologies that drive all of it. Now, are you ready to get nerdy? Welcome to the Dastardly Dingoes Podcast, the show about all things nerdy. Uh, it's a show where we discuss nerd news, uh, we talk about comics, movies, and so much more. I'm Brian. Oh, I'm Chad. Oh, gosh. I am Chad. <laughs> I'm Grandma. <laughs> and I love our opening. That's awesome. Because we're about to get nerdy. Good grief. Um, all right, well, Chad tonight... Too good grief, Chad. Could just no, raise Chad. your hands up, Chad. Chad yes, knows. we know, oh, Chad. Raise your hand up and get ready to, to, to do your Vanna White thing because we want to um, uh, just proclaim and shout the Rising Tide Broadcast Network from the mountaintops. Uh, it's a great community to be a part of, it is a great um, YouTube network to uh to watch to glean uh a lot of information from you can talk about comics you, you, you there are shows about um watches cigars um there's just shows about being creative uh we're one of them and then tomorrow morning uh which will be the next show after us tonight uh is never mind the furthermore with our uh with our fearless leader brian k morris and uh just take a screenshot of that. These will be uh, our uh, our weekly shows. We have you. We have entertainment for you Sunday through Saturday every week. Thank you. And now um, <laughs> let's just. I kind of just want to go by jump go oh. around the uh, go around the uh, the screen here really quick, and everybody just say who you are and why you are so amazing. Jeremy, we're going to start with you. I my name is Jeremy. Um, <laughs> I make neat videos oh, i live in my basement um, <laughs> I, I live in my basement with all of my stuff <clears throat> you know i've honestly thought about like trying to find like a domain that's like jeremy's basement or something <laughs> like that just to be like a redirect oh, to man. my website i think that would be fun <clears throat> yeah. my website is jeremywoodring.com thank you that was go there great. and stuff I- a great time that you just end of this. advertisement damien well you're <laughs> suckling <laughs> the on the on the uh, the what was it the milk from uh the last jedi there you got uh, there it's really cold lemonade because as right. you put here i'm still sick yeah mm. covid boy yes, over here baby, baby. <clears throat> one of the biggest containers i've ever seen 
it is a gallon. It's a gallon oh, wow. of water. I'm pushing fluids. Mm, pushing. All right. Well, tell us, pushing. tell us who you are and what, where we can find your creative endeavors, sick boy. I, I am Grandma Steve. I fight for <laughs> and somebody, that's the other guy. I fight for America. Um, oh, in my spare time, <laughs> I am Damian Waldbrun, and I draw pictures and I make websites and toys and sometimes, but not always, I have an amazing jug. Red. That was that, <laughs> that is, is awesome. Hey, Chad, I am Chad, still please. Ill. <laughs> what? I'm still ill. Oh, good grief. Chad, why don't you save us from this, please? My name is Chad, and there is my wall of beautiful. Say it. Say, it. Hum- Say what humility. it is. There it is. Wall of humility. Wall of hubris. I'm, I am the <laughs> creator and genius behind the silence. Gross. You can find me <laughs> my stuff at the silence comics.com where you'll find is. out that I'm <laughs> dot e, dot edu dot tv where you'll find oh. that I'm a really big deal. <laughs> Island got... Hi everyone. I apologize ahead of time for what is apparently happening on the show tonight. Um, I'm I'm Brian Rodman. Uh, I'm the creator, uh, author, and illustrator of uh, The Nebulizer and uh, Memoirs of an <coughs> Angel. You can find both of those at brianrobin.com. I am also one-fourth of Comic Book Spectrum uh, here on the Rising Tide Network every Thursday night at 7 p.m., and I am unfortunately a part of one-fourth of the Dastardly Dingoes podcast yes. as well, uh, which you are unfortunately tuning into now may god have mercy on your soul and uh now that we are jumping into jumping out of that let's jump back into some comments really quick before we get started donna carly carlene coming in hot at 6 19 p.m whoa just early early hi donna that was terrifying uh donna if you need to run away that is okay um and ted says hello donna good evening all donna says hi ted everybody's talking to each other very sad news about meredith yes um for those who just tuned in we did um a a bit of a we started the show off just uh you know really commemorating meredith and uh and having a moment of silence we we will miss her very much this is terrible yeah. tragic news um but we wanted to we wanted to keep going we wanted to keep doing the show tonight uh as scheduled because uh, i really do think that's what she'd want us to do um and uh she was such a huge part of our community such a huge part of uh of the indie circle that we're in and rising tide and indie vault and uh, she was a great great woman so um yeah she will absolutely be missed uh donna's saying hi to everybody um and she also echoes that it's very sad. She says, so sad about Meredith. Uh, we met her and, and uh, she and Pat shared their home and food with us. We'll miss her. Yes. Um, she's She was that kind of person. I mean, I, I got to, you know, kind of talk with her a few times off and on and, and interact with her quite a bit on social media. And she was always a very giving person. Um, and uh, great, great lady. Uh, Eric says, what did I just tune into? I am not sure um but we're gonna find out aren't we and we'll find out together eric um uh donna says i don't think you really want to know the eric hawkins and you might be right eric says can chad's head fit into the camera who boy what an ego brian k morris level <laughs> ego yes yes more roasting uh meredith <laughs> would say get back to work and you are correct carl Witzman. she absolutely would and we're gonna honor her with that um right now Tonight, uh, we are actually going to continue this past season, uh, last season, this season, we have discussed the importance of worldview uh, for storytelling, and uh, we will be talking about a specific application of that um, tonight, and we will be talking about the practical uh, approach of character building. Um, And, uh, you know, we we, we each, we're comic book creators, videographer, toy maker, and comic book creator. Um, So I think this is going to be a really interesting uh, discussion. I'm pretty excited about it. You guys in the comments section definitely uh, speak up and share your opinions with us. Uh, But to start off the show, we're going to do our famous breaking the ice question that uh, also I do want to say. Uh, the only compliment I'm going to give him this evening is um, Chad Nuss 
wrote the outline for our uh, episode tonight. Um, so not only is it way too long for this episode alone, <laughs> it is amazing. So thank you, Chad. We'll and probably end up doing two parts oh, again God. because your You're genius welcome. is just too much for an hour and a half. Um, so uh, we're going to start with uh, with the Chadwick himself on this icebreaker question. What is your favorite fictional character and why? You know, it's a great question. I had a hard time really narrowing it down. <clears throat> you wrote I this. I know. It's for you guys, too. Gosh. It's not just Ugh. questions for me, weirdo. <laughs> so I had a hard time with that. So, I, you know, I looked through some movies I had and books I read. And I had a hard time really just narrowing it down. So I, it's probably a poor choice, but I went with two. Um, one was Leonidas from 300. Terrible. Really, I love his character. I love watching that movie. I just like, there's something about him. He's got like this um, <clears throat> combination of like a gentleness and humility and kindness, but also like this fierceness that I really love. Like there's those scenes with when he's with, um, I forget what his name is, but the, the humpback guy, I forget um, the guy that um, he's deformed. And so he can't fight. And there's that scene where he meets with him and he's explaining to him, like, you know, I love your valor. I love that you want to help us, but you know, you can't, you can't fight with us because it, and he explains why, why it would be a liability. He doesn't just say, <clears throat> you know, get out of here. You're deformed. Like he really tries to treat him like a person and then gives him a job. Like if he wants to be a part of it, gives him a job to do. I, I really love that scene. Um, I hate the reaction. I understand the reaction of, you know, really wanting to fight for Leonidas and then being told to like carry the dead bodies. Like that can be really humiliating. <clears throat> but at the same time, like Leonidas was probably the first one to actually treat him like a human being. Yeah. Um, and then he turns around and just has this fierce, like strong leadership that I really love about him. Um, he's just like, kind of like a man's man, like not, not like a type a go out and kill everyone. And I'm, you know, bigger and badder than everyone else, but That's just favorite. strong. Yeah. Yeah. They're my favorite, especially when they're like super arrogant, but like he has that like humility and fierceness as well. That's why I love with that. And then the second one I was going to pick and I was a little bit hesitant because I, I haven't read a lot of the comics about him and that kind of thing. But so I'm just kind of basing it more off the movie, but I really like Thanos because he's the kind of bad guy where you empathize with him a little bit. Like you kind of see where he's like seeing that there's something wrong with the universe and he wants to fix it. Now, obviously he does it in a horrid way, but you kind of see, that's the thing I love about bad evil characters is that from their perspective, they're trying to do what's right. But mm -hmm. obviously from everyone else's perspective, it, it's actually wrong. But I think that's what makes the bad character so compelling is that, that you know, you, you can see where they're coming from, even if you disagree with how, with their solution or what they, with their actions. So he would be my, one of my other favorites, uh, favorite yeah. characters. So. Two, yeah, two two things about that. I think the kindest thing Leonidas ever did was kick that guy down a well. Uh, secondly, yeah, that was awesome. Um, yeah. That was pretty sweet. Secondly, yeah. um, the you like movie Thanos. Comic yeah. book Thanos is nothing like that because his motivation for killing half the universe. And Damien, correct me if I'm wrong here. It's be, it was to impress Lady Death, right? Well, um, and yeah. death. Just death. That's right. Not lady. Oh, death. Okay. That's a different character. Yeah. But yeah, it was too. It was essentially he killed everybody because he wanted to impress death. He wanted her okay, love. I, it. I don't like yeah. that version. I like the other. Yeah. I like movie version. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. The movie version. I would say the movie <clears throat> version is much more compelling because it makes yeah. him more interesting. But yes, yeah, that was yeah, his. That was sure. his. He also had a cool, you know, Thanos helicopter in the comics, which is in Loki. By the yeah, way, yeah, I was about to say it yeah, is in nice. Loki, okay. which is pretty funny. Awesome. That's why he had the blade in the movie. <clears throat> That's why he had the, the double-headed bl double blade. That the, yeah, it looked like a helicopter blade. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. do that. Yeah, That's part of what That's they're pretty sweet. Doing. And uh, Eric Hawkins says Quasimodo. Is that who you're talking about? I um, guess it, yeah. I can't think of who, what it's uh, actually. It's not his name, but I, I don't remember it. It's yeah. something very Greek. Um, <laughs> but uh, Damien, what about you? Who's your favorite fictional character and why? I had to just look up his last name, so I feel really bad. Um, but... I remembered the character. Um, so my favorite, uh, 
my favorite book series is the dark tower um uh, mm. hey, i'm a stephen king fan so, why uh, do you so hate to say I, that i don't hate to say it like i should just say it with like relish and enjoy yeah, it he's an saying. amazing writer um and well, the dark is, tower is a fantastic series but how many people do you know that you say i like stephen king like mm, stephen king you know, that's like well, screw them i don't care yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, screw them yeah i yeah. stephen king yeah yeah but, uh, with proudness proudness is a lot of anyway there you go anyway dark tower series favorite series um i was thinking about all the characters that you could pick from and i was like this you know maybe my favorite character isn't here at least it is and it's not anybody you'd think it's eddie dean Ooh, he's a great character eddie dean is my favorite character in the dark town from start to finish from his entrance to his exit from that story Mm -hmm. he changes so much and develop so much into the person that he had always wanted to be in the life that he had before he ended up with Roland and on the road to the dark tower. Mm -hmm. Um, Spoiler. uh, He was a drug runner. He uh, was a heroin addict. He had an older brother that ended up getting murdered uh, for helping him try to get clean and try to get out of that life. And Eddie, after his murder, Eddie got deeper into that life. And in the book, The Drawing of the Three, Rowan steps through these doors into another world and into Eddie Dean. Into this version of, you know, what potentially could be another version of him. You don't know at this point in the story, and I'm not going to tell you. But when he steps back through the door back into Midworld, Eddie comes with him. Hmm. And he is sort of thrown into this post-apocalyptic fantasy, hyper sci-fi, multidimensional, crazy reality from like 1984, New York. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so he literally has to learn on the fly with this guy who's like, you know, I've had three fingers cut off. Cut off. I've seen like civilizations die. Uh, You know, I, I had to kill my, family and i had to watch my friends die and i had to watch all this stuff and i'm still here and i'm getting to that damn tower and you can either come with me or you can like sit here and die peace and he's got to follow him he has nowhere else to go and over the course of his arc through that story he finds love he finds companionship he can become he feels that he can trust himself not even just that you know he through through with friendships and through adversity he learns about himself to a degree where by his end quote unquote he is the man he wanted to be mm-hmm. and is more or less rewarded for it by the universe um you have to read it to find out i'm not gonna tell you anything about that part but uh, if you don't read it you're missing out and if you're one of those people that like nah, Stephen king Shut up. Read it. Trust me. And if you hate reading like Jeremy does, get the Audible. Oh, yeah. They're all on Audible. Yeah. They're really good, too. It is so, true. Yeah. I like sense. I like the way that they produced that uh, series. I only read the first book. The Gunslinger. The series. Yeah. Yeah. But um, there, it was more than just like somebody reading. There was, you know, that you could tell that they were putting a lot more into it than that yeah it was more of a more of a radio show kind of feel yeah yeah so uh eric uh found the the answer we were looking for it's a fail tease um and i remember that now thank you eric thank you the eric hawkins um jeremy what about you buddy yeah um my favorite fictional character is forrest gump nice um he is like the ultimate human. If you really think about it, Um, it, it's, he's something that we should all aspire to because he's consistent. Right. You know, and that that's part of what somebody would see as like a, a a detractor because he's kind of dumb, but you know like so he hasn't really grown much from when he was a child so like in the movie from when we see him first to the end like he hasn't gotten a whole lot smarter there hasn't been a whole lot that has 
changed, but he he's there and he's consistent and he's content with whatever is in front of him at that moment. You know, the, the movie shows all of these great things like happening around him. But if you really look at the things that that he said that he wanted, not just like situations that he just kind of like happened into, it was uh, the best job that I've ever had is mowing grass. You know what I like? All the things that he has, he built, he accidentally built a corporation, right? (laughs) You know what I mean? And none of that means anything to him, but like a pair of shoes, the love of his life and, and mowing grass, that's it. And and I think, I think it's something that we, we should all aspire to, you know what I mean? So I can't aspire to mow grass. I'm allergic. Just put a really? bag over <laughs> over your head just... to prevent the allergens or something. I don't no, know. Just bite off at the bottom. No, I'm drunk. And breathe in deeply. Just go oh. ahead and put a bag over your head now. How about that? <laughs> um, I think my my favorite um my favorite <clears throat> fictional character. I have a two way tie. And it no. is, uh, yes. no, you're not doing one that is... with this one. No, no, you're not Chad doing that it. with this one. Chad did it, and so am I. So you shut your face, right. um, stay in your basement, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chad wrote the question, therefore, Chad can make the rules here. Uh, um, go ahead, Brian. It's the only time I'm nice to you. I appreciate it. Uh, no, the first one is Hellboy. Um, and I actually, I, I, I movie and comic in the same way um because he his character pretty much stays the same um for the most part there's some differences in the movies um but he's just like he's just an every every day normal guy that all like but he has this stone hand that apparently you know that brings about the end of the world and um and he has this, you know, prophecy that's always looming over him, but he just wants to be a normal dude. Uh, and he wants to do the right thing. And he, you know, and he, he really does like pave his own way. Um, even though time and time again, people are like, you're never going to escape your destiny. He's just like, well, screw you. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I like that. You know, I like that. It's just a normal guy. that's like, no, this is, this thing isn't going to define me. I'm going to define me. And I am going to to fight this, you know, this destiny of me becoming this evil thing. And and it's not it doesn't just bring about like motivation to fight monsters, but it's also fighting the monster that he is supposed to become. And I just I love that about his character. And all the while he's still he's still the sarcastic just average guy attitude about everything and um and and in hellboy in the series like you really see him hit like depression lows and and go on drinking benders because of things that he's been through and it's not he doesn't just always just pop right back up and overcome stuff there's like three books where he's just getting drunk because of the stuff that's happened to him and then he overcomes that and, and I mean, literally goes to hell at one point um, and, and then somehow makes the best of that situation as well. And, um, and, and it's just a really interesting character and I love his attitude. He's so much fun to read. Um, and honestly, in many ways, like I just, his personality, I feel like I, 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 don't know, I relate to his personality quite a bit. Um, and the other one is Samwise Gamgee. Uh, from Lord of the Rings. I think there is never going to be a better friend in literature than that little hobbit. Um, he stuck it out through everything, always stayed by Frodo's side, um, helped carry the weight of the ring and, you know, physically, you know, literally and uh, metaphorically. And uh, if, if it weren't for Sam, the world would have ended. And it wasn't because he did anything amazingly heroic other than hit a few orcs with a frying pan. Um, he was just a good friend and he didn't leave Frodo alone. He fought 
When Frodo wanted to go off and be in isolation, he wouldn't let him. When Frodo betrayed him, he came back and saved him. Uh, Sam is the hero of Lord of the Rings in many, many ways. And uh, and if you wanna, if if you want a, 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 to see what a good friend is, go no further than that character. Um, he's he's awesome. He's amazing. So, so he's those are my beautiful. two picks. He's a definition of ride or die. Do what? I say he's the definition of ride or die. Yes, very yeah. much, very much so. Um, so yeah, those two and for different reasons, but those two are my my two favorite characters of all time. Uh, jumping right. in the comments, Ted Davies says his favorite fictional character is the infamous Chad Nuss and Grandma Steve. Did you guys know you aren't real? That's amazing. We're not. Oh wait, hold on. Chad. Yeah. Oh, maybe he meant Chad Nuss. Because no, I'm real. Well, maybe not. I'm not real. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Carl says, I might say Arthur Dent from the Hitchhiker series. Uh, he is just a regular guy who spends most of the time looking for a cup of tea while the everything falls apart. That is a great, great choice, Carl. Mm. Um, guys, if you don't know, it's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, mm. And uh, it's fantastic. Damien, what you got? I illegally purchased because it was meant for high school kids and i was in middle school at the time i illegally purchased a copy of so long and thanks for all the fish when i was like 12 <laughs> I think for any child the best time to be given you know a, a cerbic british wit is 12 yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you yeah, and yeah of that, I I, Monty Python. <laughs> that yeah. and dark tower honestly on the same they're they're nice. like tied for number one as far as my my best series even the one that that uh, uh douglas adams all you know almost wrote most of and then the guy who wrote artemis fowl finished it i can't remember his name mm, um even that one's good and it's it's so uh evocative of douglas adams so if you haven't read that please do yeah and the movie's good too it really was it was life-changing yeah. carl the movie's great too um ted davies oh whoops Oh, it snuck in there. Ted Davies said, uh, actually, Chewbacca is my favorite fictional character. Sorry, Chad and Grandma Steve. Chewbacca, right. similar to Sam, except Sam can't rip people's arms off. Um, Chewbacca. And, uh, Carl, maybe he can. We just don't know. Carl Rootsman says, it was a life-changing thing, wasn't it, Damien? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> what, what, about, uh, what about bad guys? What's our what, favorite what, bad guys? Yeah. What, what are your favorite bad guys? You're going off book here, Jeremy. I don't know I if know. Chad can allow it. No, it's good. I like you it. You can see that you see the frustration in his eyes. I mean, <laughs> you can all, you can like skip your turn because you said Thanos. Yeah, that's what I, was bad I already said yeah. one. Yeah. 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 You did. <clears throat> all right. Well, Jeremy, who you got? I was really thinking like there's so many good bad guys and I, I i think it's it's fun to i think it's fun to think about like who the best you know like how do you how do you rate that right because they're awful terrible people um but i think uh i think percy from the green mile oh i hate just, him yeah i know yeah i know I mean, there there are few characters that that bring that emotion and like across the board. Yeah, there's nobody on earth that's like, I think I could hang out with that guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> everyone, oh, there's somebody, and that's what yeah, hates. somebody. There's somebody. There is somebody that's like he's my yeah, hero. my cousin. Somebody. <laughs> just, just the freaking worst, man. And and for the whole movie. He's just awful and just keeps getting more awful. And, mm. and there's no, there's no like release to that, you know, until like the very end. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. What about yeah. you? Uh, Damien? Mm, I know the first one I liked and that was Magneto. And it was all oh, good. Pretty, I mean, I hate to stick to comics, but how dare you? <laughs> and, okay, how dare so you? so 
I literally have it sitting here next to me. X-Men 221 was my first. Uh, third comic book, first superhero comic. Okay. And that allowed me to go further back into the series to kind of pick up older issues. So around that time, it was when Magneto had... Um, there was an aspect of his personality where he his magnetism affected his personality, so he was sort of bipolar. Mm. Uh, so he'd be good and bad, and he would sort of flip back and forth depending on what sort of grievous wound he... And they carried that on into the 90s and early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Until they decided, this is nuts. This doesn't make any sense. Let's make this make sense. And they fixed it. But it was at the beginning of that where he had just stopped helping the new mutants, training them, and he was trying to atone for everything he had done up to that point. Like he had you know, sunk a sub and murdered you know, 2,000 people and he had been this villain for years. And then they, it was the first trial of Magneto. It was actually a trial. Like the UN got together and put him on trial. And that's when you find out a lot more about his history and that how, how he was in Auschwitz and what happened to his parents mm-hmm. and how he died, you know, how he should have died and dug his way out of the, you know, the, the, the body pit to survive. Um, and that evil can be subjective. Um, it can be um, a point of view thing. And again, it was at an early enough age where it was like, oh, that's, you know, I've always been told this is evil, this is good, this, you know, this is black, this is white, this is so and so. And so to see that play out, even in a fictional setting, was something that really attracted me to that character. And I realized I've kind of always liked when he rode that line. Like the Magneto that they have now in the X-Men books rides that line by mm-hmm. choice, not by some sort of weird affect of power. Yeah. He's I am he's all he's as pro mutant as he's ever been, but as one of the mutant society's rules is kill you know, harm no human, don't kill humans. He honors that rule, which is something he's never done. Yeah. So he's really becoming his own character instead of this sort of two-dimensional villain or scatterbrained or crazy or I mean at one point am- amnesiatic. Yeah. I'm, I'm pronouncing that right. Um, he's becoming a more three-dimensional character now than he is, than he's ever been. And I guess he's still not technically a villain, but he is. He's always skirted that line. And there for a little while, uh, I think, what was at the end of Chris Claremont's run? He was actually in charge of the X-Men. He, yeah. Well, actually, yeah. before uh, Jim Lee, he and Jim Lee de- debuted X-Men number one. Yeah. He was in charge of the X-Men. Like, he's been in charge of the X-Men multiple times throughout. Yeah. Um, but now he's actually on the quiet council on Krakoa that is running mutant kind on earth mm. for, you know, the, for, for, the, the, blah, blah, the foreseeable future. That's, that's called cold medication kids. Ah. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I, I think Ian McKellen did such a good job depicting that character, um, in the first two X-Men movies specifically. Um, and then I think you saw the good side of him in Days of Future Past. Um, and that's, that is the Magneto that they've written into that mm-hmm. one from the, the old X Men cover where he's like, eh, and they're all coming yeah. at him. You know, they've written that into that character now. And so it's like mm-hmm. a much more developed idea yeah. than just, I'm a villain, I'm a bad guy. Mm. Yeah, I'm a bad. Um, <laughs> I'm a beat you. <laughs> <laughs> um, just jumping into the comments really quick. Ch- Ted Davies artistry says my favorite bad guy. Uh, Chrisser says is Maleficent. I think my favorite bad guy is Darth Vader, hands down. Uh, I mean, hand down. Oh, oh <laughs> gosh. <laughs> or does he just like Vader that much? Ah, ah weird. Mm-hmm. And uh, Carl Wittman says for too. me. <laughs> Probably Professor Ooh, Professor Moriarty from Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Uh, he was just as bright as Holmes, but chose to use his genius for selfish uses. Yes. I love Moriarty. Mor- yeah. I hate, hate, hate Moriarty in the BBC show. I absolutely hate him. I think he's the most annoying person to ever exist, but I, I love was- him in the books and in the movies. Um, I was about to say the exact opposite. Oh, I hate him. I hate him in the show. 
it, he's the just, guy that just, plays the way he talks, so I want to just punch him in the throat. Ugh. Don't get me wrong. Like the arc, the the arc of the character, I liked. I liked that he was always one step ahead. I liked. I mean, he's classic Moriarty in that way. How the yeah. perf- the how he was directed to perform the character, I hated that. Absolutely hated it. He was too. He was like a weird version of the Joker, and I didn't care for it. I the, that first twist in that series, where he's the guy in like the lab partner of. I can't remember yeah. her name. Yeah. And like you had already seen him. I love mm-hmm. with like stories, whether it's a comic or a movie or TV, like whenever they do the, you've already seen the bad guy. Yeah. That's always fun. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, like, don't get me wrong. Like I enjoyed the story. It was just when he spoke, it was like nails on a talk chalkboard and he's not a bad actor at all. Like I've seen him in other things. He's a good actor. It was just the choice of that character compared to who he is in the books and who he is in the books is much more uh, on par with who he is in the second uh, Robert Downey Jr. Movie. Um, yeah. And that version of the character, how he is performed is I, I, I prefer that much, much more. Did you did you watch the elementary show on CBS? Was I never the, did. I never really got into it. it I liked it. I, yeah, I liked. Yeah, I, I thought it was. I thought it was cool. Um, Moriarty in that is his like uh, is a girlfriend of his, like a a former lover who turned, yeah. or maybe always was evil or whatever. But like if you think about the mind games that Moriarty plays, Mm -hmm. just imagine also adding into that, like the intimacy of being like former lovers and the, the depths that you can add to that mind game. Oh yeah. Like that's a really interesting take. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Yeah. That that, I I might give that show a try. I've, I've kind of, I've been spoiled by streaming. I can't really watch network television shows anymore. (laughs) There's just, there's too many filler episodes. On Paramount Plus. I mean, I know, but I still have to watch 22 episodes to get to the point. He's saying like, you know, eight action packed episodes versus like 26, you know, like like half of them don't really matter at all. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't mind 22, like, if you have 22 episodes and each one tells them, a, a, like, it is yeah. a pivotal part of the story, it's one of the reasons I like 24 so much. Most of that show, every show, every episode mattered. There were just so many shows like that, though, where, like, it, it's like, you know, 15 episodes you could have easily been taken out of the show and you would have never noticed. <laughs> so, um, I, I've um, always liked uh, Johnny Lee Miller. I think that's what his name is. The mm-hmm. guy who plays Sherlock Holmes. I, yeah. I liked yeah. I, I like him. I liked him in, oh, what was that movie he was in with, uh, was it Hackers? Hackers. Yes. Yeah, Hackers, I loved yeah. him in Hackers. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hacks and uh, Carl Witzman is, uh, <laughs> is laughing at Ted. Uh, Ted says, actually, the villain. Um, mm, uh, grammar. I. I the villain, like, I, I don't like it all. I don't know. I'm just saying there are are the intellectuals that like decided to ban Mouse in Tennessee? Oh, Where, right. yes, that's yes. We'll talk about that another time. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, Carl Witzman uh, says, Are you talking about the movie Moriarty? I did not know there was a movie called Moriarty or the one on the British. Oh, the movie Moriarty. Sorry, not the movie titled Moriarty. I don't like the one on BBC. I like the I like the Moriarty in the movies. Hopefully that clears that up. Um, so my favorite villain of all time is Dracula. Um, I and I don't nice. mean like love story Dracula, where he's super sexy and he takes his shirt off and wisps in the window. No, I'm talking about the monstrous plague inducing Dracula, <laughs> uh, the one from the book. There was nothing romantic about this character at all. It had nothing to do with sexual tension. It was all about him being essentially the son of Satan. Um, And I got to give a huge shout out really quick because I think the best, like other than the original novel, which I do read every Halloween so far, 
the best book outside of the original that I have read that depicts this character in amazing ways is this. Uh, mm -hmm. Is Dracula of Transylvania. Um, and it is by uh, Ricardo Delgado. Uh, it was a kickstarted book. Um, I mean, he took the original story is still there, but what he did was he made um, Dracula even more evil. And, um, and it's like, if you know, if you've heard my spiel about memoirs of an angel, you've heard me use the term. It's Lord of the Rings meets the exorcist. This is too. Um, it is so well done and it captures the spirit of how evil Dracula is. Um, because I, I like well-rounded evil characters. I like complicated villains, uh, like Magneto, uh, like Thanos. I like, you know, villains that you can kind of feel for sympathetic villain, but I love villains who are just evil. Um, you know, they're evil because they, they just are. Because that's also a thing. I feel like in a lot of literature, a lot of movies, we've lost that. Is that there are beings, there are nasty, evil uh, creatures, there are people who are just evil. Um, and there's not really a whole lot of reasons why. And that is, evil. that is terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And though, and I think Dracula just the the traditional version of Dracula, um, the just the monstrous the monstrous grotesque um, version of him that just feeds off of people. That's the best villain, in my opinion. It is All is right. the one who everyone everyone who you know they everybody may have their own problems with each other and fight amongst themselves, but that's a villain that can unite all of those people to go after. Mm. And I love that kind of villain. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, I like it. So, Chad, so <clears throat> what, away? yeah. So, what we want to do for this next part is kind of a roundtable discussion. There are questions that are specific to each person, but I'd love for there to be some interaction <clears throat> from everyone as far as just their take and maybe ask ask additional questions of the person. So, the first round of questions is for Brian about memoirs of an angel specifically the characters. And so just talk about how you came up with the characters of Memoirs of an Angel and how you designed their backstory. What was your process and, and approach to doing that? Um, well, a lot of... Um, thank you, Chad. I appreciate You're welcome. the question. It's yes. pronounced Mimu Fan Angel. Indeed, yes. Mimu Fan Angel, Mimu Fan actually. <laughs> yeah, Mimu Fan Angel. Um, no, it's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, but uh, a lot of like my characters honestly have come out of stuff I've learned theologically, which is how I created the the story itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, I would say that a lot of so the main character. Jonathan um, is uh, a lot of his backstory. A lot of who he is are um, really, it, it came out of struggles in my own life, uh, struggles with my personality, struggles with, um, you know, questioning, doubting my faith at different times, um, you know, kind of the feelings that I felt I poured into him as an adult where we meet him in issue one. Um, and, uh, you know, especially, essentially when I was just like at, um, at the lowest of lows is where he came from in my life. Um, and so what, and I, I, in memoirs, I, I always want to make the, the people, the humans are always gray in different, different, different variations of, of, uh, of gray, morally gray. Um, so they're not, not all of them are a hundred percent bad. Not all of them are a hundred percent good. They're all over the place. And, and we really see that uh, as we continue to go through the series with, uh, with Jonathan um, up to this point, we've mostly known Jonathan as a child who is possessed. So we're kind of getting a feel for where he's coming from. Um, but if you look at issue one, you see, this is a man who is, 
bitter, broken, and you have no idea how he emotionally got to this place. And it's because he's not a good guy. Like, like spoiler alert, the dude, I mean, is he makes a ton of terrible decisions in his life. Um, and, and you find that out mostly in the next, in the next few issues as we move forward. But his, the essence of his character was me struggling through, um, like I said, different doubts that I had different times in my life where I did not make good decisions. Um, it was that. So, uh, but on the flip side, it is very difficult to make, um, characters that are perfect, uh, because I am imperfect and, um, and, and it's so hard to write angels, um, who are completely holy. Um, so I am very well, I'm totally aware that I have not accomplished that <laughs> in, in the comics. The, uh, they, there will be times where someone would be like, this isn't a perfect decision. You're right. It's not, but it's the best I could do. Um, but my inspiration for a lot of my angelic characters were, um, characters in other works. Um, like uh, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of interactions with Aslan in the Narnia series. Um, I, I took a lot from that. I took a lot from Gandalf and Lord of the Rings, uh, and the, and, you know, different, different characters, uh, the angelic characters that I've, I'm, I'm creating, um, they always do have a parallel, uh, to another character in fiction. Um, because like I said, I myself cannot write a perfect character. These other characters aren't perfect, but they help me. They use, I use them as a guide to, to kind of, like how would how would Gandalf handle this situation and 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 write that character in the in that way, uh, and then it, in doing that, doing that, um, you know, in, in different thought exercises, different you know, kind of dialogue exercises that I do, um, usually in the shower because that's where all the ideas happen. Um, that's where I find the character. That's where mm-hmm. I find who they are, and then they get their own voice. And by the time it gets to the page, and I'm drawing it the character is being solidified as we go. Yeah. Um, like, and then there's some characters. Um, sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I like what you said about their um, making them kind of gray area when it comes to like morals and those kind of things. Because when I was a, a younger man, um, I was pretty super old now. Yeah, yeah I am. Uh, <laughs> I was pretty judgmental. I'd be the first person to tell you that. And had in my mind categories of like, these people are bad and these people are good. Now, looking back on that, I realize how wrong that is, because as you as you live life, you you see that people come in shades of gray. Like there are people that you would on the outside see and think, man, they're ruining their life. But then as you get to know them, you see why they make the decisions they do. And, And a lot of times maybe it's their background or their family situation or whatever it is, you know? And so I love that you had mentioned about how your characters are more of a gray, you know, there, there, mm-hmm. there's so many factors that contribute to a character and, and their personality and those kind of things. The other perfect thing is boring. Say, perfect is boring. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect, that, yeah. Well, uh, our depiction of perfect is boring, real perfect that we have no, I could no clue what that's like. Cause we're, we can't understand it um, because we're so imperfect as humans but 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 yeah our depict uh, what we think of as perfection is super boring because we're like well that's not interesting we can't relate to that i've heard actors talk about that evil characters are much easier to play than normal good characters because normal good characters often come off real bland and boring whereas evil characters is like so interesting and so in, in the same way i can it's I love that you said that writing the angels is actually the hardest thing because they're perfect. <clears throat> and, and there is a sense in which like, yeah, like how do you identify with that? How do you even put yourself in their position to think of what would they say and how they react to, you know, various mm-hmm. situations. It's very difficult. I'd never, never had thought about that. <clears throat> yeah. So, I, I mean, and, and like I said, that there are other characters and other situations that uh, authors that are much better than me have, have somehow been able to figure that out. And I, I, you know, I start there. And like I said, by the time it, it gets to the page of memoirs, it, it has become its own thing. Um, and really like a lot of it, I do believe like there are, 
and I'm going to get a little theological here, but I, I personally do believe that, you know, we as um, humans have free will. We have choice. We have, you know, not a hundred percent free will. Obviously you can't decide who your parents are. You can't decide, you know, what, you know, what, you know, worldview you're taught to believe when you're a child. But um, at some point there, there are choices that you make and there are, um, there are consequences of those choices. And, and there to have choice, you have to have uh, the ability to choose something right or wrong that they have to be there. And I think it's the same for un the unseen realm, um, you know, angels, demons. Uh, I, I think that, that, now I think the more you choose to do right, the more solidified you become in that. And I think the more you choose to do wrong, the more solidified in that you become. Not that it's hopeless, but <clears throat> um, but I think that in that process, I, I, I think there are still very interesting things that angels can experience um, in real life. I believe that. Uh, I totally do. And, and I think that, you know, there are choices and decisions that they struggle and have to walk through. Um, I, I mean, you look at passages in, in, in the Bible, you know, just if you're talking specifically Christian theology, uh, which is what memoirs is based on, uh, you know, you look at, um, you know, st passages like Daniel 10, uh, where it talks about, you know, the struggles that the angel that comes before Daniel had uh, before even getting to him because Daniel prayed, um, you know, for God to answer his prayer, to give him, you know, uh, understanding of these visions. And it took 20 days for this angel to get to Daniel. And when, and when the angel gets to Daniel, he explains the reason that I didn't come immediately was because there was a demonic force who was named as the Prince of Persia, um, who was holding me up. And I couldn't, I had to have somebody come relieve me so that I could come to you. And it's fascinating, like little glimpses. You don't really get it. It's not really explained. It's not, you know, you don't get the, any explanations there, but it shows you that there is a lot more interesting things happening in the unseen realm from that perspective of biblical <clears throat> theology uh, and, 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 you know, in the Christian worldview. Uh, than what I think we've given a lot of attention to in Christian circles. And so that particular, actually that particular passage really became a huge inspiration for what the angels in my, in my stories go through um, because it's so much more interesting than just, Oh, we're in we have harps somewhere in the clouds and we're just happy all the time. No, the, the Bible clearly says that it's a war zone. Um, yeah. in the, in the unseen realm right now. So like that, that is what I really wanted to depict, uh, when making this comic series. And I mean, really you go beyond, you know, the Christian worldview, you look at mythology, um, you know, Greek gods, my gosh, that's a soap opera. You know what I, mean? I mean, so, you know, it's, there's so much, there's so many interesting things that I, I believe myth, uh, mythical beings, mythical, um, you know, gods uh can 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 show us and that that you know we can in a sense uh, say that we share some of the same experiences at least on a choice level that uh beings in the unseen realm do yeah. um and we don't really know what that looks like i mean you know we, yeah. we we have some glimpses here and there um but we don't you know from from where i'm saying i i don't know i don't know I, this is all fiction it's all you know yeah. but it, it really fuels what i want these characters to do and and how they how they interact with each other yeah you kind of answered the question about what's unique about your main characters just because you talked about the difference between the angels and the other characters and things like that i <clears throat> i'm going to go a little off off uh, script here and just ask you a different question how do you how do you approach writing a character like do you actually put yourself in the position of the character you try to put your mind inside them or like how do you practically uh, write a character in your story it for me it depends on the character um i know that um a lot of times when i'm writing and i'm trying to figure out what a character is i will do thought exercises of usually dialogue between that character and another character and mm -hmm. through that just kind of experiment that i'm that's going on in my head 
uh, whether I'm writing it down physically or not, um, that's where, you know, I, I may take the role of each character and think through, well, how would they say this? What's their background? Why did they, what, what's their exact, um, you know, approach to this worldview that they're talking to this other person? What's this person's goal? What's what, you know, versus what this person's goal is. Um, and through all of those, that myriad of questions and, and, you know, just kind of wrestling through what that looks like. It's kind of like watching a movie in my head. Um, and then I'm directing it kind of. So like, I'll go through a scene and then I'll be <laughs> like, no, that doesn't work. And this is why, yeah. and this is and through that chiseling, uh, and sculpting that, that scene, I get the characters and then nice. I'll run with the characters after that. Good. Good. All right. Last question for you, Mr. Rodman, which character do you identify with the most from memoirs of an angel? Um, man, that's tough. Cause there's a little bit of me in every, in every one of them. Um, I think, uh, I think, well, Jonathan, for, for obvious reasons that I've already said, but also a Kalian, um, because I think, um, you know, during the last, you know, five years or so, unfortunately, you know, I've, ex like many, many people, I've experienced um, loss of relationships, um, people that were once very close and are not anymore for various reasons. And um, it just seems to have happened all here lately in the last you know few years and um i didn't intentionally do this um when i was writing this story arc i came up with the story arc that, I, that we're going through now um that is ending in the next two issues um i wrote it years ago years ago before any of this stuff happened and then, but, but a lot of it had to do with, um, you know, the background between Akalian and, uh, Batiel, who is his friend, his brother, um, Batiel chooses to follow Lucifer mm. and the, the, the dark kingdom. Uh, but he does it after he already wrestles with the problem of evil and discovers that God is just a liar. Uh, and, and he has convinced himself of that. So he rejects the king he rejects you know this path that has been you know in his opinion you know forced on them and he, they've been fed lies and so he leaves this all together and then finds this other community in the darkness and then begins to crave power and not that anybody in my life has actually done that that is not that is not the case but but uh Akalian, um really wrestles with uh this loss and really wrestles with depression and really wrestles with, and we see it in the issue in issue eight, the one that just got kickstarted, um, you know, funded last year that I'm about to release next month. Um, we really see what toll it took on him. And, and we really have to deal with Akalian has to, in many ways, recover from that loss as much as he can and remember who he is through that and who he has become because of that loss. And I, relate to that here recently uh, a lot more than I did when I came up with the story. Um, so uh, in, I'm finding that, so to say all that, I say I, I'm, I'm finding that I am understanding my characters more than I ever thought or expected to as we keep going. And I think that's nice. true for every author. <clears throat> I really do. I, yeah. I think, you know, you start off with, with who these characters are in your head and who you want them to be. And then as you go on this journey, especially if it's an ongoing story um, mm -hmm. that takes years to create, um, you begin to find yourself understanding them in ways you never predicted. Yeah. And relating to them in those ways as well. Yeah. They take on a life of their own. It's crazy. They really do. And it's, 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 yeah. it kind of makes you feel psychotic, but you know, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, let's take a quick break really quick and jump into the comments section um chad do you want to ask jeremy the questions next as well yeah i'll do that That'd okay be fine. cool um carl oh <clears throat> sorry buddy uh ted ted davies says hit that like button that's right hit the like button smash, do it. It. smash, smash. it 
and hit that oh, bell gosh. as well so you can get notified. Uh, Ted says, oh, my gosh, Rodman thanked Nuss. Date and time recorded. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nick Tucker says, wow, you're, uh, are you saying some villains don't need to be redeemable in fiction? I am absolutely saying that. I actually prefer those kind of villains. Uh, Carl Witzman says, thanks for reminding me, Ted. My mind is scattered tonight. All of our minds are scattered tonight, sir. You are not alone at all. Um, Ted Davies says, understood, bro. Nick Tucker says, as a religious person, do you feel intimidated? Oh, this is for me. Do, uh, do you feel intimidated, uh, concerned about using real named entities in your fiction? I don't, um, because first of all, I am not assuming that my version of this real, you know, real named entity is the real version of this entity. You know, like, I, I don't, I'm not saying, well, I've got it all figured out. Just follow me and read my comic and you'll know exactly what's going on out there. That's bull crap. This is fiction. Uh, it's based on uh, what, um, you know, is is uh, believed to be real entities in different forms. Um, and, uh, and I personally, you know, it's no secret. I'm personally a Christian. I, I absolutely believe the, the validity of a lot of these characters. Um, and I want to stay true to that. I also want to stay true to the characters um, that I will write in other uh, stories down the road that I have planned on that aren't a part of Christian worldview. And I want to stay as true to these characters as I, as I can in the worldview that they're presented in from their own context. But at the end of the day, they have become my own you know, fictional version of these entities. So in no way do I think that they're, you know, that, that they're the exact same thing. So I, I, I don't have a problem with it, honestly. Um, Michaela Jade. Hello, madam. She says, hello guys. Everybody's saying hello to Michaela. She's saying hi to Carl and Donna. Uh, all right, Chad, take it away. All right, Jeremy, it's your turn. What? While, when you're sitting in your basement alone, tell me <laughs> your thoughts, your inner thoughts. No, really, I would love to hear from more of a videographer, technical side of things about um, storytelling, specifically about character development. So what practical steps do you take in trying to capture the story a person wants to tell through video? So if a client comes to you and they say, um, I don't know, you can use whatever example you want. Let's say, you know, they own a business and they want to, they want to tell something about that business. Maybe they want to say our business is very charitable or whatever. And they come to you and they say, let's make some videos about that. Uh, what steps do you take to, to tell that story and capture that story? Well, I think, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, it's so, I don't, I don't want to say it's so easy, but there are so many avenues in the like visual like film and television medium because you can you can say something visually with color you can you can even communicate with like without words where you're just mm -hmm. seeing someone's face and their expression and that expression is moving you know compared to where it's you know a static image in a photograph or you know, in a comic book or things like that. And you also have, uh, you know, you, you can use audio. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of times, one of the biggest things is picking like music to go underneath a video. Um, and, and you have to, you have to like know your, know the audience, you know what I mean? You, you don't want to, you know, so right now I'm working on a video for, um, a foundation that raises money for childhood cancer, right? And so the video that we just got done uh, shooting, we're interviewing families who have been affected by childhood cancer. And so when I'm going to make this video, I'm not going to put like EDM music underneath that you know what i mean like you you yeah. just gotta you gotta know your your audience and you know the same with with lighting um uh you can get into you can get into editing different ways uh you know if you're if you're wanting to communicate that like a character is 
um, just this like slow menacing presence. Like I'm, I'm thinking about like no country for old men, the editing for that opening scene is just, it's so, it's so perfect, you know, because he is such a slow menacing figure. I, I actually watched it today just to remind myself how long it actually is. It's five minutes long where the guy is just saying pick heads or tails. Like almost nothing else is accomplished. It's just, mm. and they use, they use a lot of times uh, what's called a J cut, which is um, where you're seeing somebody reacting to the person talking. That's what a J cut is. So instead of the shot being on the person saying the words, you're seeing what somebody is reacting to. And that, that can be really effective because like I said, now you're hearing what that person is saying, but you're also seeing the, the reception of that, you know, and, yeah. and you can tell that guy, that gas station owner gets like more and more concerned because of how yeah. weird Anton Sugar is. I mean, it, He's just, there's no other way to, to see. you've never met anybody in your life that is going to act that way. He's just so strange. And, mm. and it, it, it's beautiful in that way that they, they let that, they let those feelings just sit and, and it's, but it's not boring. It, it's like ramping up your emotions and your feelings and things like that because of how, it's almost like you're in a straight jacket. Like they put you in a straight jacket and then you're, you're forced to watch this and you, your heart rate just like, you know, it gets, yeah. it, it gets elevated. You know, then you also look at the use of color. Um, uh, Stephen King himself said that one of the most, uh, one of the, the most terrifying villains he's ever seen or read is Dolores Umbridge from Harry Potter. Yes. And, and it's true. She is just, she's so awful in the same way that like the Percy character from green mile is because it's just unrelenting. She is never good. There is never the, uh, there's not that like complicated villain like Thanos or whatever, you know, where, there's aspects of their personality that you're cool with. No, yeah. you just hate everything about her throughout the whole thing. But, but it's like the, in, in the editing, it's like they're saying, uh, or like, it, it's like a form of satire. I think that she's wearing pink. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it, it's like, they're telling a joke on their own, on the own, their own story, if, if that makes sense. They're saying, yeah. oh, no, she's so, like, unassuming because she's wearing pink. Oh, no, this is literally the worst person you've ever met in your whole life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so you have to make those choices. And some it, it's difficult because sometimes doing the opposite will make it better, like in this case, um, you know, or... I think of Quentin Tarantino likes to use like very primary colors to represent different people. You think of uh, Kill Bill, that yellow jumpsuit, um, and yeah. and yellow is you know she is the good guy. She is the heroine of the story. Um, or if you look look at uh, Jackie Brown, she's walking down that uh, that moving uh, sidewalk in the airport and uh there's th these like beautiful mosaics behind her as she's moving along and and they're very primary colors and she's wearing this like brilliant blue uh outfit like a, a uniform because uh, she's a stewardess i think yeah i, I know she does mm -hmm. something at the airport i can't remember yeah. exactly what but you know so it it's it's interesting you have to make those decisions do i do i go opposite to bring you know to say something or do i do i kind of foreshadow maybe where you're you're 
telegraphing who this person is before you tell the the audience if that makes sense you know yeah there's just all kinds of ways to to develop those characters in like b- besides the script i think a lot of times people take movies as what is being said to the screen and there's mm. there's so often that everything else and if you're paying attention everything else is saying the exact opposite Mm, and and yeah i i I like when movies do that you know in in the movies that people are like oh that was one of my favorites a lot of times they don't realize that well that was intentional like we were really trying to sell that outside of just saying this is what we want you to think in in the movie Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> so basically you're trying to say that we need to contact this client for children's cancer and tell them that you're referencing no country for old men in making their video. Is that, yeah. is that where we're yep. going with this? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> do you, how much, like how much do you refer to other movies? Like when someone comes to you with an idea, is that your first move? Like you start thinking, okay, where did I see these certain things in different movies and how can I use that or apply that to what I'm doing now? Do you do that a lot? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. For a, for a certain, um, for certain projects. I mean, a lot of times, like if you're making um, videos for businesses, there's, you're, you're kind of limited in what you can do. You're not going like, yeah full Wes Anderson with something, you know what I mean? And like Mm. creating this like brilliant, crazy world, you have to kind of stick to reality because at at the end of the day, they're just selling a product. Um, But there are other times where you have more, more freedom with that. Um, Like your creative decisions. And I'm, I'm having like when I've had conversations with you, Chad, or with you, Brian, about this next video that we're doing, I'm having ideas in my head. And that also helps me figure out, like, if I want to pull off something, being able to have a reference where I can say, okay, well, let's break down this effect and figure out how to replicate that in, in a certain way. Um, like yeah. for, for you, Chad, one of the videos that I made for you and we ended up going in a different way, but it was cool figuring out how to do the like Marvel page flip thing. Yeah. You, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like I was thinking yeah. about that as a background to be shining through the letters and things like that. So it was, it was easier for me to have that reference um, because then I can break down the individual elements and, and it becomes not so, uh, it's something tangible. It's easier to get your mind around something if you have, if you have that reference. So I'm always seeing in movies or TV shows, um, things that I'm like, Oh, that would be cool. The, you know, even if it's just like, how slow this push in is for um for like an insert shot for for a conversation you know because yeah. that's something i can tie to making a video for a business if i'm interviewing somebody and we're having a conversation and it's it's serious or something that that slow push in in movies that it it gets you you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it sucks you in no matter what. Um, it, it's it's a really powerful shot. And if that's the point in the video where we're wanting to communicate something powerfully, well, let's do it then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That makes sense? Do you – yes. And this okay. is kind you of – You know, hey, Jeremy, it, it, it absolutely does make sense. You know who else thinks it makes sense? You. <laughs> yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> It's me. Her Isn't fans. that terrifying, everyone? We I know it. it is. So you talked a little bit about editing, um, so we won't dwell too much on that, but I want to reword the last question for you and just say, okay, do you, do you always approach your projects as if it were a story to tell, or are there other ways that you approach projects? 
No, I mean, I, I think it's, it's everything is storytelling. The lights that you use, you're creating an environment. I mean, that's, that's storytelling. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think there is a project that I've ever worked on that is not telling a story. Um, why, yeah. why do you think story is so compelling? <clears throat> I mean, I think humanity is, is just wired for story. Um, yeah. You know, the, from like cave paintings on walls to blockbuster movies, like the, the entire, the entire scope of humanity is we've been trying to tell stories from the very beginning. And yeah. I think, I think that's, storytelling is at the heart of selling a product storytelling is at the heart of you know something that is more obvious storytelling like in comics and movies and things like that but yeah we're we're always trying to to tell a story it just did it come across or did did it not yeah. you know um was it effective storytelling or not <laughs> or was right. it subtle or you know whatever well, my cross examination of Jeremy is finished. So, oh wow! Else well, let's might... well let's jump into the comments really quick. Uh, Rick Bradley says, uh, "Good evening, dingoes. Eat any babies lately?" <laughs> Chad absolutely did. Um, absolutely. And uh, Carl Whitney says, did. "Love those J cuts in movies, Jeremy." Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Jeremy, I did want to say this, um, and I think. In the future episodes, we need to start incorporating this uh, this angle of storytelling a little bit more uh, from you know just the technical side from from filmmaking and from video producing. Yeah. I, I think that it's an important side of storytelling that we don't really talk about very much in comic book circles and things like that. Right. But like all of us love movies, all of us love um, you know the the visual medium of videos and movies, and and you have such a great I for those things uh and, and the fact that you. you in in your own perspective you you call it storytelling um is brilliant i love yeah. that I, and and i really just want to um just reiterate that that i think we need more of it and more talk and i think we need to talk about it more and i think you have yeah. a lot to offer in that area um, yeah i just so, i just have to be careful that i don't like info dump <laughs> you know what i mean like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, hey i mean like, that's what this show's about it. though you know yeah. like it, it's yeah. it's you know we're here to just not to not just talk about <laughs> the uh the the obvious ways of storytelling but the the subtle ways as well because it, yeah. it tells like you said like like I love the I love what you said about her, about Umbridge's outfit and her her surroundings everything like you know her office is covered in kitten plates she yeah. you know she wears pink so everything her visually is, yeah everything that, visually so is screaming like innocent yeah. like innocent pure um and she is absolutely diabolical yeah. in her actions yeah. and her words and you can um, see little like just. I mean, they they were so good. Just this like little twinge in her eye, and you knew mm. it's about to go down. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it, it, it was so it was so good. I, I really enjoyed the way that they made her character. Yeah. And I would like to say a great to talking about villains, talking about you know the 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 more subtle storytelling, just from from you know shots and visual. Um, just there no verbal storytelling in this at all. You can tell the difference between the two characters of Umbridge and Snape if you watch the overarching story of Harry Potter. It doesn't happen in the same story in the movies. Um, in in Harry Potter three, um, Prisoner of Azkaban, there's a part where Lupin turns into a werewolf for the first time. You see Snape, who is the obvious jerk was it has been hinted as the the secret villain the whole time so far what does he do when lupin turns into a werewolf he immediately protects the kids of that he hates right. he can't stand these students but yeah. he he protects them he jumps in front of them puts his arms out so that they are protected and and and, and lupin's werewolf has to get through him to get to them 
what does umbridge do in order of the phoenix when they're in the haunted forest and the centaurs, the centaurs are coming yeah. after them she, she gets, gets behind, behind the students yeah. I just and watched you, that today, man. Yeah. You yeah. notice that difference in these two characters is Snape is the opposite of Umbridge. Visually, he's he's darkness, he's yeah. black, he's moody, he's he's a he's an absolute dick most of the time. Right. Yeah. Um and but he, when the time comes, is is loyal to Dumbledore, makes the decisions that nobody else can make, and he does it inspired by love and loyalty. Whereas Umbridge appears and likes to put on the persona of um, this facade of being pure and good and is actually yeah. very dark in her soul. Um, I thought and, she was and, a much better character than Voldemort. Like, I, I, it, I just, it depends on what kind of villain you're looking at. Uh, yeah. I, I, think, I think Voldemort in the books much more interesting. Voldemort in the movies felt a little shallow in comparison. He's still very good, but it, he is much more interesting in the books. You should really learn to read, Jeremy. I think I think that would help you a lot in life. Maybe I can have somebody <laughs> read to me. Hey, you uh, like Stephen, if, you can, me. if you can find it, Stephen Fry did an audio um, recording of all the Harry Potter series. I know. I wanted to. I, I saw an interview with him where he was like laughing about he couldn't. There was a line that he couldn't say. Pocketed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Harry pocketed it. Yeah, he pocketed it. it, it. <laughs> <laughs> so know, I'm, I'm saying. All I'm to, saying is to listen to that. Yeah, there are ways. Steve, there are ways to to listen to this version in America. Yeah. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Hey guys, and I may or may uh, not know the ways. So. Just real, just real quick. I know we like to kind of limit our show to an hour, hour and a half, somewhere around there. And I really want to hear from Damien because I'm very interested in the toy making process and story. Mm -hmm. So I would say for the last part of the show, I'd love to hear from Damien. And then, um, and then we can end it there because we really can't do a part two because next week we have a guest. So. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if my part gets cut out, it's not a big deal because I'm happy to talk about the silence any other time. Uh, well, and every I time personally, I, can, so. I personally am always for you being cut short. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's a great idea. Um, and Chad, big, since you're laying on the sword for this episode, which we will, they're very good questions for you. We will come back to it, um, another time for sure. Uh, and, and hear, hear what you have to say about characters. Um, but why don't you go ahead and, and finish off the, the questions that you so beautifully wrote. And oh, well, thank you. Amen. Yes. Thank you. I feel like the, uh, the squirrels and Looney Tunes are we're, we're just going back and forth. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. But before you, before you continue, before you continue, let's jump back into the comments really quick. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Ryan Permissen has joined us. Hello, sir. How are you? Hope you're doing well. Uh, uh, Donna yeah. says, Hello. Uh, Rick Bradley says, I would rather have Voldemort chasing me instead of Umbridge. That woman is 100% yep. cool, and you are correct. She is. Ryan Permissen says, if I am writing a story, first thing I think of is what can my reader relate to with these characters? That's a great place to start. Um, and I think a lot of authors should think of that more when they're writing, mm. is relatability yeah. to your characters, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Rick Bradley says, her little tee yes. Yeah, she's awful. <laughs> and she, more than Pennywise ever could. I love Pennywise. Yeah. I think Pennywise is hilarious. I her hold her the red balloon. Yes, indeed. All right, Chad, go for it. So, Damien, you work with character development from two angles. You are both a comic book creator and a toy maker. And I would really love to hear about your process in making toys. So, first of all, why do you think so many people identify with characters through toys? A lot, I think a lot of it is marketing. People of a certain age were raised in a time when marketing and content distribution were one and the same. Such and a romantic answer. It's the truth. I, I mean, <laughs> why do things like Transformers, G.I. Joe, Mask, GoBot, why do all those 80s toys, why aren't we talking about Lincoln Logs or Tinker Toys or in those same vein? There's you know, a the podcast about Lincoln it. Logs. I'm well, just going to sure say it. it. Here's a podcast. <laughs> My mama's dirty socks. That's not the point. 
But there was this wedge of time from like the late seventies to the early nineties where concepts were, were marketing ploys for toys and cartoons and this all encompassing experience. And I think that even though there have been laws put in place to avoid that, that idea of you are a part of a community with the product developed into our modern ideas of fandom and have pushed even further into to really be into something is to buy the t-shirts and the toys and the posters and the Funko pops and, you know, to have the full experience is to consume the product in its entirety. And toys are a quick portable way of doing that. Yes. How does that relate to me <laughs> is I started making toys cause I wanted a toy of my character. I'd spent almost 25 years making a character and writing stories about them. And neither one of those are my characters. Um, but that's a byproduct yeah, of what you I, made these. I did. I did. But I wanted a character of mine. I wanted my guy. And it was too expensive to have somebody make one. It was like 250 bucks to have somebody do one, you know, 24 point articulation action figure piece together from something else. It didn't look quite right. It would never move the right way. It would just be a really expensive shelf piece. And to me, toys are to be played with. They have to look cool. They have to be played with. They got to stand up on their own. Like literally, I mean, stand up on their own. Like you got to be able to put them on their feet and they can stand. Uh, and that's what I wanted to make. And I realized I could do that if I learned how to 3d model and that was fun because I got to use all my drawing expertise, everything I learned from comics about shade shape and definition and form just translated directly to a 3d model world. It took time to learn. I already thought in three dimensions anyway, to get like angles and things, but to actually be able to take the object and turn it slightly and see the effect that this line was having on this piece and this piece by able to physically turn it to see what happened. That helped a lot. And when I'm working on someone else's toy, I want to take all those things that I've learned and apply it to someone else's thought. Like when I was working with Brian, I was like, what do you want? Like, what do you want to see? What do you see as the toy in your head? Because he created Moriel, he created the nebulizer. He's going to know a thousand times better than me what a cool nebulizer toy is going to be, you know. And at the end of the day, if he thinks it's cool and he thinks it's it's right, it's cool. then somebody else is too. Um, it, it's cool, by the way. It's super cool. It he did an cool. amazing job. Look like the first, the first character I did was Kenny Aiken's Apex. Because I really liked the character. He's also movie. really cool. <laughs> and I did, I just did it. And I texted Kenny. I said, Hey, I, th I 3D modeled this. What do you think? He was like, That's so cool. Can I have one? I said, You got a Kickstarter, right? <laughs> what if I give you five of them and we see how people like them? Hmm. And so I just, I made five packaging and all. And uh, I can't stand packaging that doesn't like reclose. Like, I don't want to take my pop. All my pops are in boxes because I, I I have to keep them in the box because if I take them out of the box and the box is ruined, the toys it loses its value. But if you could take the idea of playing with a toy and incorporate it into the design and of even the packaging, as well as the figure, then it's, you get to have that experience of, I own this thing and it's not just on a shelf. I can take it out. I can move its arms, twist its legs. I can play with it. It is my toy. I get to have fun with this. And then there it goes. And it's still a cool thing. I'm going to have on my shelf. Um, so what is your what is your process in making a toy from for someone? So like take us from start to finish, and how do you try to capture the essence of that character in the toy? Every toy is a collaboration. Like every toy is a collaboration. It is the idea is theirs. I never want to own or take their idea in any way, shape, or form. Uh, from the beginning, 
And in the contract is it's everything you bring to the table, you own everything I bring to the table, I own, and we're working on a collaborative effort. And then it's really going back and forth with the creator and showing them turnarounds and, you know, here's the limitations that I'm working in as far as articulation and size. And here's what I can make for you. And then we just take that raw material and just work it and work it and work it and work it till it's what the creator thinks that's the toy I want. And it's, I enjoy that process. I mean, I've had it, I've had seven or eight iterations of figure before. Not with Brian. Brian was very, Brian's been very great about, very, very good about everything. And he knows what he wants and he's able to convey it really easily. Um, but I've done I just said, many- make toy is fun and he does amazing things. <laughs> Well, like on the app, and this Tim has toys. <laughs> the point. Um, the figures that I make are usually solid pieces. There's not a lot of like add on tubes or for now, uh, add on tubes or things. And the nebulizer has two big tubes, you know, that come into his pack on the back. So we had to figure out a way to make it so that the tubes were part of the body and then it could be split because they came right down where the arm joint would be. So we modeled it 100% three-dimensionally, and then I tried a couple cuts and showed Brian, and he's picked one the one that he liked the most, and then that's what we went with to production. In that case, I've never told Brian this, I probably oh. had five or six, uh, and when I say prints, I don't mean like an arm, I mean like 20 arms, be bad. <laughs> like 20 arms at a pop just because that that didn't work right, that that piece didn't form right together i threw him out uh that, that's me i didn't charge him that was nothing i would that's well thank that's you i didn't know I that tell me next too. time no that's that's part of who i am with making these these toys man i want them to be your toy i want you to go i love this i want to put this on my shelf because if you like it then anybody that likes your art and likes the nebulizer is going to like that toy yeah fair if you're happy and you created this thing, then I know everybody else is going to be happy with it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you're not happy, why are we making a toy? You know, yeah. I'm not looking to make a payday. I'm looking to create something. Collaborate. And that's why you're a good toy maker, sir. Thank you. But basically my process is work close with the client, make sure it's what they want from step A to step Z, test print, production, We work on the packaging together. We do everything all the way down the line to the finished product. And then if we paint, then we paint, we show them the painted colors and we go from there. You you draw (laughs) straight into a a 3D program? Yeah. Yeah. What program uh, do you use? I use ZBrush. I started with Sculptress, which is the art side of ZBrush. Um, ZBrush is a lot more like clay than... uh, than like blender it's a lot less math based and more creative based mm-hmm. literally i'm like with my stylus on my tablet monitor like scrape like scraping away at clay and pulling and pushing and making it into uh i think it, that would be that would be easier for me rather would, than it's fun. doing something like blender i think it it just the idea of working with clay makes more sense to me i guess and it's just as easy as clay to me um when i first started the idea of making uh toys i was gonna make molds and then pour the molds and then put the pieces together and so i bought 25 pounds of clay i think it's still here somewhere (laughs) i have about 21 pounds left Mm. because i took like five pounds or four pounds of clay and put it on a table and went I don't know how to mold clay. What am I doing? (laughs) Let me see. It was all just a learning experience. Like that was, that is what I want to keep with each client and with each toy is this is a learning experience for both of us. It's a collaborative effort. We're creating a piece of art, even if that art can be played with and taken to the bathtub and thrown in the air and chewed on by your dog. Which is what I do. Hmm. Have your dog (laughs) chewed on it? No. (laughs) No, I take, no, I take my clothes to the bathtub. Man, <laughs> this is fun. Splashing oh, yeah. around in the yeah. water. Ah! Yeah, all the time. You mean this guy right here? Yep. I was making extra one for me. I'm just letting you know that. 
Yeah. You like, oh, I make one extra. Take as many as you want. This is ours, actually. Because she, <laughs> she finished awesome. these, she painted all these, and she was like, where's ours? <laughs> right. nice. Well, we didn't make one. She's like, no, no. Where's yeah. ours? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You make <laughs> I busted my hump on this. Where's ours? Right. If you've ever seen one of her toys painted, uh, more than likely it was painted by her. I think Kenny got some painted of his. Um, I think Luke, Luke Stone, we did his uh, trash man character. Mm-hmm. I think he had some painted, but if they're in the original packaging, unopened, it's all Lauren. She mm-hmm. has gone from better painter than me to I'm not even going to try. Like she's just that good. Like here, baby, just take this, please. <laughs> she's really good. Like, don't call me baby. Uh, you're my employee. Here we go. <laughs> We're at work, yeah. sir. <laughs> but um, nice. did that answer your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that was that was perfect. That was the amazing. most I've talked all. in like three days, so my lungs are kind of going. Eh, you can stop. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am going to pass it back over to Brian to close us out on this sure thing. fantastic episode. Yeah, and Chad, we will get back to uh, the silence. Your 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 questions probably. We'll we'll get back to you in as long as it takes you to get out another book. Uh, so jumping <laughs> back to the comments section, um, <laughs> uh, Carl Witzman says, hi, Luna. Bye, Luna. Okay, Carl says, hi, you want to come say hi? Come here. Says hi. Luna. Mal. Hello. Mal. Hello, Earthlings. Mal. 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 Oh, yep, see? Oh, you there you go. So there you go. Um, that was not a happy meow. And, um, <laughs> unhand me. Uh, yes, unhand me, you fiend. Um, Rick Bradley uh, says, everyone, I introduce the new toy maker, Batman Beware. Excellent. I think that would be absolutely fantastic. Brian K. Morris, <laughs> good sir. He says, oh, good. I showed up just in time to hear some fresh <laughs> cat abuse. It's what, you know what? It's served up nice and hot. Uh, with a sick burn every time as Damien just for disappears you. into the darkness, coughing. Uh, that was an ominous, uh, ominous, mm, ominous mm. at all. Uh, ominous. Yeah, you're back. Good. Uh, Donna Carly, Carly says that's my sweet Luna. Luna is currently <sighs> chewing on my fan. Stop that! Stop it. She's chewing on your fan. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so everybody, thank you so much uh, for tuning in uh to tonight's episode um thank you for being a part of the discussion as well in the comments section um and uh if you would please subscribe to our channel hit the uh the notification button uh and uh, get ready uh for a host of great shows to come next week chad what we got going on next week we have a, a guest interview with mr lee giles Oh, yes, that's right. So tune in next week. We have an interview. Bring your questions as well. Uh, We will get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, And Rick Bradley says, I feel you, Damien. My lungs have been killing me since COVID hit, and my job is talking on the phone all day. May God have mercy on your soul, sir. That sounds awful. Um, But, uh, guys, uh, thank you all for being here, all three of you, Um, Damien, especially you, I know uh, you're feeling like crap right now, so thank you for being I here. Like warm crap, <laughs> delicious. Um, and uh, once again, thank you all in the comments section. Uh, have fun, be safe, don't do drugs. If you do, call Chad, he'll do them with you. Uh, and yes. we will see you guys tomorrow or tomorrow. We'll see you guys well in the Rising Tide Network. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Uh, for uh, never mind the 10 a.m. tomorrow, 10 a.m. tomorrow, and, <laughs> 10 <a. m. laughs> and uh, but tomorrow. you will see us next week, uh, on Tuesday, uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. As always, you guys have a fantastic week, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, Grandma Steve Bye. says, Well, just next time, baby.
Dun, dun, dun. Oui. Bye.